much for coming. We're Foundation FM. We're a record label and radio station that champions queer, non-binary folk and women. And it's our first time at AMS, so we're very, very um, happy to be here and hosting some panels called Planet in Progress. And it's all about getting women into spaces that they're not normally seen. And sound design and production is one that's definitely close to our heart. I'm handing over to our incredible host. I mean, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about it. And then we're going to get stuck in. But yeah, thanks so much for coming. Hi, everyone. My name is Annie. And we are so lucky to have the amazing LP GOB here with us today. Let's give a big hand. She's a multi-talented DJ, producer, pianist, and activist, and has supported iconic artists such as Pete Tong, Fatboy Slim, Diplo, DJ Tennis, and has played internationally from Fabric in London, Warehouse Project in Manchester, and Amnesia in Ushuaia right here in Ibiza. She has amassed over 100 million streams and has been tipped as an artist to watch by Spotify, Amazon, Tidal, and more. Her DJ sets incorporate live piano and modular electronics, and as a producer, she brings together a strong sense of melody and arrangements. So please, let's give another hand to LPGOB. How are you today? Good, how are you? My, my Britney microphone. I know. We might break into baby one more time. To be fair, I was gonna have one with you in solidarity, solidarity, but they only had one, so. I have to use my hands, that's why I'm wearing this. No, I love it. Okay, so thank you for that intro. We're gonna dive right in. So first of all, how many of you here are producers? Yes, or music lovers, or lifelong learners. Every hand should be up, yes, amazing. Um, so I got into sound, I actually got into producing via sound design. I went to school for jazz piano performance at UC Berkeley, and then I was playing a solo jazz gig at a bar one night, and an engineer and producer for Daft Punk came into the bar and asked if I wanted to join an all-female electronic band and I did not know what a synth was. I had no, I barely knew who Daft Punk was, which is embarrassing to say, but true. But I said yes, and I moved down to LA, and I, I learned how to sound, the, my first synths I sound design on were the Moog Voyagers from the Pyramid Tour. So I think that helped me fall in love a little bit, like their little notes on when to turn knobs and stuff, which is quite incredible. Um, and at first, I actually hated having to make the sound before I could play the notes, but now I can't imagine a world without it. And that sort of has led into my journey as a producer. So we are gonna start with the art of synthesis. What is a synthesizer? It's behind me as well, if you are a visual learner. An instrument that generates sound electronically and allows you to control the sound's timbre as well as how that sound changes over time. You can create real world instrument sounds as well as textures and specific sounds that can't be created by any real instruments. The first time I heard a synthesizer was in the, <laughs> in the movie Drive with Ryan Gosling. And it, I was blown away by the sounds and needed to learn more. Like it was the first time I didn't hear like a string instrument or you know a piano or, um, and it, it really sucked me in. So the properties of a waveform, to be a synthesis, you need the waveform. And a waveform is the speed of vibration, which determines pitch, and we measure frequency in hertz. Each pitch note has a specific frequency. Amplitude, the size of the vibration determines the loudness, and we measure loudness in decibels. So I'm gonna go move on to terminology. Timber, the sound quality, these will come up later, so the sound quality or character of a sound, is it bright, dark, squishy, wet, tiny, etc. that's the timber. Control voltage, CV, an electrical signal used to manipulate the values of components in analog circuit, circuits and harmonics. Frequencies that are positive integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. So if you play a middle C on the piano, you're also actually hearing the G above it and the C two octaves above it. And the fundamental note is still the C. So in sound design, we start with the oscillator. There are modifiers such as LFOs and filter envelopes and amp envelopes, but the top level basic flow is oscillator into filter into amp. And I started learning in um, actually Pro Tools before I moved over to Ableton. So I was using a lot of software synths when I first started sound design. It didn't really click for me until I got my hands on my first hardware synth and you can see the signal flow laid out. Here are the amplifiers. Uh, here is the filter and here is the amp envelope. And understanding that this is sort of the flow, you start with the oscillators and you move through in order to design the sound. The oscillator produces the fundamental sound that will go on to be shaped 
through this signal flow. And in the oscillator, that is where you pick the waveform. So I'm going to start in, in Ableton. There is a uh, instrument that comes in Ableton. So if you, if you had Ableton, anybody can open this up. You don't have to buy an extra synthesizer. And it is called Wavetable. I actually rarely use Wavetable, but I think as far as learning the fundamentals, this is a great place to start. So th this is, these are the oscillators. And go in here. So the top one is the square. It's a square sound. Oh, let me shorten the. If I'm creating a bass, I oftentimes use a um, square sound. It sort of works well with a kick and punches through. The next one is a saw. Uh, and the saw has more harmonics. You hear those other notes on top of the fundamental note. Um, Avicii made saws very, very popular. Uh, also, they sort of emulate the string sounds the most. And then next, this is the triangle oscillator. A lot of classic leads are made with a triangle. And then lastly, we have, this is the sign. The sign doesn't have any harmonics, and so it is best when you're making a sub bass under, under your bass. If I went down, there it is. You hear that sub. There are a few other kinds of waveforms. Uh, this synth has it, but the very basics are those four that we just went over sine, square, triangle, and saw, which are right here. So once you picked your oscillator, and in a lot of synths, you're able to have multiple oscillators that you can then mix together. But once you pick those, you move over to your filter. And the filter is where a lot of the um, shaping happens. It's, it is subtractive synthesis as you are taking away frequencies. So Right now, we have the high-pass filter. And so when you have a high-pass filter, that means that you are letting the highs in. And as you close it, you are closing up those highs. the high pass filter. Okay, so as you, <laughs> this one allows the highs in. Oh wait, no, 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 I had this right, I had this right. Sorry. High pass filter. As you open it up, you can hear the highs. As you close it, you can really only hear the lows. Low pass filter. You can hear all the frequencies. Close it, you, you can only hear the highs. And so a lot of shaping happens on the filter. Um, the residence here, you have to be careful with the residence because the residence essentially accentuates wherever the cutoff of the filter is, wherever you raise that residence, that will make that point louder. So acid base, the squelchy acidity, it's, it's made with the residence. Actually not this residence filter, it is a different residence filter, but um, same basic concept. So as I raise this, that frequency becomes louder. Then we're going to move on to the amp envelope. Traditionally, the envelope is assigned to the amp. It can also be assigned to the filter, but in this case, it is the amp envelope. And it basically controls the volume, the amp, you know, your amplifier, your speakers. This is where your final volume comes out. And it is shape over time. Every time you play a note, it will go through this shape, this ADSR shape. <clears throat> so again, a lot of the sound design happens here. ADSR is, um, you've probably heard that a lot, the shortcut. A is the attack. And this is the time it takes to go from zero to its maximum level. So if you had a lead, if you wanted it to hit right away, you would have the attack at zero. If you want it to sort of sweep in, let's say you wanted some like sweeping pads, you would raise the attack and so it will take longer to get to the, the, the final, the, full sound of the note. So this is attack at zero. Gets there right away. And if you raise it, 
it takes a minute to get there. Decay is the time it takes for the signal to fall from the max level achieved by the attack, by the attack stage, to the sustain level as the key is held. So the decay has a lot to do with the sustain, um, and it's all it's it is only involved when you're holding down the note. If you lower the sustain, it'll go through the attack, and then it'll hit the the decay at the sustain. And then lastly, the release, or, well, actually, sustain. Sustain is level that plays as you hold down the key once the attack and decay stages are complete. So if I'm moving around the sustain, if I lower the sustain, it just takes longer to get there. And then finally, the release is going from the, the sustain level to zero volume and how long that takes after you release the note. So a shorter release, release a note, it's, it's done. A longer release, hit the note, release it, it's still going on. So if you want like pads, have a lot to do with the sustain and the release. Bigger warm pads and leads have usually less sustain and release. So now I'm gonna demonstrate a real life example of a song that I have put out that has some fun sound design in it. Uh, this track is called Georgia. It came out, I think, a few weeks ago and it will be on my debut album, May 12th, shameless plug. And um, <laughs> this song is really built around, actually, this song actually came to me in a dream. I was dreaming that I was jamming with Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> which is incredible. Never wanted to wake up. And there were a bunch of tom solos and he was just ripping on the guitar over them. And so I recorded a drummer playing some tom solos couldn't quite get a guitar as good as Jimmy's in my dream, so I moved on to a bass. So um, for this one, I used a plugin. This is the Arturia Mini V plugin, and it emulates Bob Moog's classic 70s mono synth. Uh, it's one of my favorite sort of go-tos. And in here you see there are three oscillators, and then you can mix them at um, different volumes. And then here is, which we just, the, this is the cutoff, fre the frequency that we just discussed. And then the amp is down here. And this one also has a, a filter amp, but this is, the amp, this is the amp that we talked about earlier. On this one, I'm just gonna solo this for, for a minute. This is where I automated a lot of the, so this is, this, this is the automation of the cutoff filter. So the filter is low and then when you hear that wah, wah, that's me opening up the filter, letting more frequencies in. Uh, I really enjoy automating that because that sound is to me sort of psychedelic and um, allows the sound to first be sort of dark and more mysterious, and then as you open it up, again, let in more frequencies. So, it's fun. Also, the glide time is a big thing that I played with in this one. Let me open the synth back up. This one is really all about the glide to me. If I turn down the glide. We'll, con we'll continue. We'll continue on. Um, so I wanted to translate this into hardware. My friend Chloe Calais, who is based out of here, I called her freaking out a few days before this. Like, do you have a hardware synth that I can borrow? Because I'm flying in from the United States, and she let me use her brand new baby, the Prophet Five, a Dave Smith or now sequential instrument which between Moog and, and Sequential, I think they make some of the best hardware synthesizers. So this would be a hardware synth, as it is something that you can touch and turn knobs in in real life, as this is a software synth where they emulate a lot of these hardware synths. All I did was I just took the same MIDI notes and I am having the MIDI notes send information 
into this. This is a desktop version, so there's, there's no keyboard. So I'm just having, I'm setting the MIDI notes into this synth so that I, as it's playing, can sort of sound design on here. Let's say I want to start with two square. Uh, each oscillator I'm putting into square base, since that is something that I, square bases I love. Um, this is the cutoff filter, which sort of immediately manipulates the sound. If a sound is kind of sounding out of whack when I'm first trying to touch a hardware synth, I, that's usually the first thing I go to is the, is the cutoff filter. You can hear it opening up, letting more frequencies in, closing it, making it sound darker. Um, to my ear, there isn't much release or sustain in this, so I'm going to go to both the filter envelope and the amp, amp envelope and sort of open up the release instead of drawing the notes in longer, so it's as if I'm holding them down in this MIDI clip. You know, this is sort of how quickly you are touching the keyboard. Um, you can sort of do the same thing with the release. It's lasting a little bit longer. Um, here is that glide button that I was talking about before. Turning that all the way up. So when it gets to the note, a different note, that's not just the same one. You can hear it gliding up to it. Um, I have the both oscillators, one and two, mixed at full capacity, so you can hear them both equally. But let's just play around, like let's say I didn't want a square. I went to a triangle and a saw. Just changes the sound a little bit. Different waveforms will do that. Um, if I wanted to make the attack not hit right away, that like that's sort of where you get that wompy sound, womp womp womp, because you know it's not it's not hitting right on the attack. Some basses do that. I'd say like in, in disco and um, house less often. A lot of dubstep has that. I'm gonna turn that back down because I personally hate that. <laughs> and then, you know, just playing around, really just getting your hands dirty and playing around with, this is this is the filter, amp, uh, the filter envelope and the amp envelope um, and attack, decay, sustain, release on both. And just playing around until you hear a sound that you like. Um, yes, you can understand what attack and decay and sustain and release do, but you can also just move knobs until you hear something that you like, which is half the battle. Um, this, what, what wasn't on the wavetable that is here is, so here's the cutoff filter and your resonance. Make it a little bit squeegee, you gotta be careful, but um, the envelope amount affects how much you hear the filter envelope. So we have it turned up pretty loud. If I were to turn it down, it's it sort of turns the whole sound down. It's hard to hear the the filter, the sorry, yeah, the filter envelope at all, the filter cutoff at all. So these um, have a simpatico relationship to each other. Some synths don't have the envelope amount, but if they do, play with it. Yeah, so that's how I would sort of recreate the sound on a hardware synth. And I make most of my music on airplanes, and so, and then I land, I'm like, that bass sounds horrible because, you know, mixing on an airplane, but I love hardware synths, and in an ideal world, I would always get to play with them, but I just want to say that software synths, they're less expensive. They're a little bit, you know, you, you don't have, you only have to travel with your computer. I think that they're really important and really awesome and amazing that they're made. So, of course, like analog synths will always have some sort of lovely snobbery to them and they do have beautiful warm sounds. But it's really magnificent that we can carry all these machines in this tiny computer. And I think that whatever gets you to start creating, that's a fuck yeah. Thank you so much, LP Joby, for an amazing demonstration. Um, oh, oh, Sander.
you have those papers? I also um, made little cheat sheets that you can take home of all the really boring stuff we went over earlier. <laughs> that it's important to learn, but really it's just about playing around. Um, and I think that like for, for me, what really clicked is just understanding, okay, oscillator into filter into amp. That's the signal flow. And then from there, just get your hands dirty. But I did make um, a little printout of this presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, everything you've shown us is like super technical and like it, it makes sense when you're saying it, but for me personally, like I do kind of forget, I mean, mine is having the cheat sheet. If, there, if you're um, a very young new producer, like what would be kind of the one advice you'd give them if, you know, all this like technical information you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming totally. and like hard to remember. I mean, the most important thing in production are your ideas. The, I actually try to limit myself to plugins on my, uh, in Ableton because I think that <laughs> you could be there forever picking just the perfect plugin. So really the only synths that I, I use on the road are these Arturia synths, which um, I demonstrated one of them. Uh, a lot of them emulate Moog or, um, sequential synths, which I think are really wonderful synths. And a lot of them have wonderful presets. So, you know, play around with the, the presets and then maybe you find a sound that you love and you're like, oh, I just, I just wish that it would hold a little bit longer. Okay, then just like open up the release, release and sustain a little bit. Small things that you remember from this, start with the preset that you love. And there is absolutely zero shame in that and critically important and they've done a lot of work for us. And if you have great ideas, it truly does not matter. Um, also, I wanted to ask, like, how did you develop your, like, signature sound? Like, how... <laughs> <laughs> That's so sweet you would say that. I think that one of my main problems is that I make so many different kinds of songs, it's actually incredibly confusing to some people. Like, this is, this Georgia track doesn't have vocals except for a woman orgasming on a microphone, and, um, you know, then some of my That's other songs are... a great sound, <laughs> I can't lie to you. It's the best sound it's there the is. It's the best sound, yeah. <laughs> Um, but then other ones are, you know, quite poppy and um, more song driven, I guess. But I always have piano in them. I'm a piano player. And so to be true to myself in that way, a lot of my creation process starts with piano chords. So um, I guess that's kind of the one thing in common. But And you also perform with the piano sometimes. Yes, yeah. yeah. But I, I also think like not putting yourself in a box and leaving room for you. I mean, I, this is going to be a lifelong journey to find my sound, so, and I'm finally at peace with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think also just have fun, right? Like, not yes. be like, because I, I DJ, and sometimes if I'm like, I'm this kind of DJ, I'm just like, but why? Dude. You know? <laughs> I get stuck in that all the time. Like, <laughs> is this track within this box of this genre that I want to be in? And I mean, but I just saw, I was at, I played Coachella on Sunday, and I saw Fortet play oh a... God. Taylor Swift and Miley Cyrus track. So after that, I mean, Fortet, who's like the goat. Yeah. <laughs> so after that, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Yeah. Like, anything, yeah. <laughs> like, do whatever you want. Anything is possible. Yeah. I think sometimes we, our egos kind of get in the way. And totally. I'm like, I need to take it more serious. But sometimes I do think it's a female thing as well, because I think we do have so much more to prove. Yes. Like, you almost have to prove your talent. And then some, like, we're not totally. on the same playing field. Totally. But yeah, my partner was like, I mean, if he's doing it, I'm like, yeah. He's a man. He <laughs> is, it would be totally different. If I came out and played a Taylor Swift song, yeah. I'd get booed out of the Yuma, for yeah. sure. But it was cool to see him do that. Yeah. I also want to speak to you a bit about Femme House, because I think um, kind of the reason why you started it kind of aligns with, like, Foundation FM's um, goals as well. So could you tell us a bit yes. about that? Yes. Um, and in fact, I forgot that I wanted to end with. So Femme House is my nonprofit. I started to teach women and gender expansive folks how to produce music. We also very much believe in allyship and men are welcome to take our courses. They're sliding scale free for women of color and every male that has taken them has paid top dollar and turned off their camera in the sessions which is without any prompting, which is actually so fucking incredible. Oh, is it like donation based? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, so, yeah, so we offer free online workshops and courses, um, and one of them is the art of synthesis. So if you, and it's a four-week program, you can take it at your own leisure, but if you wanted to dive in more, you can go to thisisfemhouse.com. I put that on the little sheet. Um, and we have an amazing educator, Lauren Kopp, who goes by Mini Bear, the artist, and she knows absolutely everything about, she's a, 
uh, Ableton certified trainer and she is a beast. So if you want to learn in a safe space, there's a place for you. Also, it's crazy because I think out of producers, women only make up 2%. Yeah. Which is crazy. You know, and like that is a really horrifying statistic. I think that the it's it's 2% of like top X, top like, I don't know, 100 producers, like top hot 100 or something like that, which is still messed up. But there are actually so many female producers out there. They just aren't getting as much credit or the big accolades or, you know, but I know that that's changing over time. <laughs> I mean, have you faced any like obstacles, do you think, because of being a woman, like a female producer? Yeah, I mean, the main thing I faced was, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a privileged white woman who had wonderful parents who were like, you can do anything and you can be anything. And so I already know I started at a, at a really, really lucky privileged place. But the biggest obstacle I faced was belief in myself and visual representation. It wasn't until I heard that Grimes produced her own records that I even thought that could be a role. I, I was in the studio constantly in this band with male producers who I had a great experience with, but I was in the studio one day waiting to play my synth part and I read this article where Grimes was very adamant about saying, you know, I am my, the, my own producer for my own songs. And this crazy light bulb went off for me because here I, you know, I, I was raised by people who, you know, you can do anything, but because I didn't see myself in that role, it truly never occurred to me. And that's where I learned the power of visual representation and um, really wanted to be that for somebody else and became dead set on learning how to produce, even though I had no natural ability or skill and also let me to start Femme House. I mean, you have uh, amazing skills. That, just I mean, like, <laughs> we all do. Like, if I can do it, truly anybody can, yeah. is the point. I kind of felt the similar thing when um, I, I saw or read that Billie Eilish and... Um, Phineas. Fin Phineas. Like, they made the entire album, like, in one bedroom. Just the two of them. Just the in two the of them. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> like, because I was like, I've been wanting to produce for years. And I was like, what am I actually doing? Truly, like, without... I mean, I, I watched her documentary. Like, there's not even, like, since... It's literally a bedroom Honestly, where she actually sleeps yeah. in, like, a computer and a guitar. Oh, my God. And I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got shit to do. Um, I wanted to open up if there were any questions from the audience. Hello. I was kind of wondering, because you have been trained musically, how you kind of let go of all that training and just let yourself play. That is an think, excellent question. Yeah, I find that really difficult. Like, yeah. Just to let myself it, go extremely. back to that state and play. Yes. So um, when I first started making dance music, I... What brought me into dance music was I went to my first DJ show in college when I was studying jazz, and I, I was actually so confused. There was, like, one guy up there, and all the sound was... I was like, where's the band? Like, why is, there, why is there all this sound with, like, one guy? I didn't understand that there was a USB stick, and that's where everything was coming from. <laughs> um, but then my friend broke down, like, this is body music. It's for, it's for your body, not your mind. Like, there's going to be a kick and a hi-hat for seven minutes, and the hi-hat's going to be taken out and then brought back in. It's going to feel euphoric sort of almost meditation in that way. And in school, I, I had gotten to a point where I was intellectualizing everything. I knew exactly the notes that go over the, you know, each chord change. And, but I stopped feeling it, unfortunately, through, you know, through the process of getting graded on it and studying it. And so that, that really sucked me in. But when I first started making dance music, all the feedback I got was like, whoa, you're, you're doing way too much. Like, does this actually feel good? Like, are you just like playing diminished seventh chords because you're wanting to like show us how smart you are? Like, do they actually sound good here? I really had to strip a lot back and go to the fundamentals of, of rhythm and just really listening to what felt good in my body. And probably over the last like two or three years, I've slowly been able to bring back more complicated chord changes because I know when to use them, not just because I want to sound snobby or smart but because like they'll actually the resolve will feel good but that's taken me like five years to trust myself to bring that back in just to add on to that because I know it's a common thing of producers to sit there and just over like just add more like play with this and I don't even know the words yes, yes. <laughs> yeah just overproduce it so when you're creating a track like when like, do you know when to stop? Or are I'm you one of the... I'm actually the opposite of that. Oh, okay. Like, I'm actually... My team's like, mm, you're not done here. Like, I, <laughs> <laughs> like it, ta it takes, like, 90% of the effort to get the last 10% done, usually, you know? Like, it's like, you're in the flow, and you're creating, and the ideas are coming, and then you really have to get in there and fine-tune. And I'm always like, like, we got the idea down. Like, I just want to go work on the next idea, because that's the fun part. And I, I usually have to, like, 
be told this sounds still like a demo, like you got to finish it. So I don't have that. Luckily I have people around me who tell me the truth. And so I like get in there and do the nitpicky stuff, but gosh, I like as, as I'd love to move on to the creation process. That's obviously the fun part and where the, where you, where you get in flow and the rest of it is, is more technical and, you know, obviously important, but, um, way less fun for me. Um, do you have collaborators that you work with or are you solo? You know, I was actually just sitting on a panel with Steph LaFerra and we talked, uh, she brought this up. She was the one who had sat down and had a big talk with me about this. So at first I was like, when I started making my own music and it wasn't that great. It was actually straight bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she, I was, you know, watching YouTube tutorials and taking online courses, learn how to mix and master everything myself because, like, I felt like I, I had to, like, prove myself. And it was, that's a horrible use of my time. Mixing and mastering is not um, a skill that I'm good at. The creation process and sound design is, you know, where I have fun and, and collaborating with singers and things like that. And so she was like, this is what is, to her, she felt like one of the things that was holding a lot of women back is that, we feel like we need to do everything and prove that we can do everything. And actually, she's like, every single guy, she was a manager at the time, and she had some huge clients. Every single guy that I work with, not a single, there's about 15 to 20 people that touch each song before it's done. And they don't bat an eyelash at that. And you're holding yourself back. Go find the best mix engineer and go find the best mas master engineer. And I was like, whoa. Um, and that, that really was, like, game changing for me. It allowed me to A, spend more time doing what I'm good at and B, working with people that are the best at what they're best at. Sometimes if I'm nervous, I just think, what would a white man think? And then I'm like, oh, I'm not nervous at all. I got this. Liter literally. I mean, you know, there are some amazing dude producers that I'm sure do do everything, but most of them do not. Yeah. And sometimes it's good to, you know, your specific skill might not be like, your best skill might not be in every single thing yeah. that you do, so, yeah. I mean, I barely have the patience to finish a track, so, fuck, yeah. <laughs> I, d I, d I definitely need a good mix engineer, yeah. How, how long does it take for you, for, would you say, like, from start to finish to finish a track? Well, I started touring like an insane person right after the pandemic, and so, you know, I really get, like, an hour on an airplane here and a few hours in a hotel room here and maybe 30 minutes before I go on stage here and... The idea of songs comes pretty quickly, but getting it to like a decent point, it can take anywhere from, you know, a full day to months. Like right now, I have maybe nine or ten ideas, and maybe one of them will end up being good enough. But I have to have at least that many going to, to see what does turn out. And your debut album, you said, is coming out yes. in two weeks. Yes. You need to plug it. One more time. It's coming out on Ninja Tune on May 12th. And it was, that, that process was crazy because I was just releasing singles th before this, which actually was way less stressful. It was just like, okay, song's done, boom, single, great. And it was actually Pete Tong who <laughs> years ago was like, you know, you're an album artist. And I was like, no. <laughs> like that sounds so much harder. Or, you know, like I have to like make a whole world and everything I'm like, uh, and he's like, you just are. And so I sort of started seeing myself a little bit differently through that mirror. And also then I got sick of having to like make every s song I released a single, you know, a banger, like I had to have a vocal, like be successful on Spotify. Blah, blah, blah. So an album allowed me to make intros and interludes and B-sides, and those are my favorite songs for sure on the album. And yes, nobody will listen to them, but but they are there, and I made them, and they're out <laughs> in the world. And um, I wrote all the songs on airplanes and trains and hotel rooms, and then I flew to Paris and routed, like, you know, did sort of the same concept, took the MIDI and ran it through vintage synthesizers in DJ Tennis's studio in Paris, and we turned knobs for days and days, and then recorded live drums and layered those with the electronic drums so that everything sort of was in the same cohesive world, and it, it did take way more work. I'm like, yeah, this, this was harder than I even thought it would be, but um, ultimately, I'm really proud of the body of work, and so, like all good things that are hard, it was worth it. It was worth it. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah, Let's give another hand you. to LP GOB. And thank you to Foundation FM. Yeah, thank you Foundation. I love what you're doing. It is so <laughs> cool and so important. Thank you. Thank you guys.